Great, so this is our final session, a conversation with David Bergen. My name is Aileen Friesen, and I am an associate professor and the co-director of the Center for Transnational Mennonite Studies, which is hosting this conference. Uh, now, both Sarah Clausen, who we had yesterday morning, and Sandra Birdsell, who was here last night, had literary moderators. So you should have a little bit of sympathy for David, because he has to put up with me, a historian. And um, in preparing my comments to introduce David Bergen, I'm sure all of you know who he is, but he still needs an introduction. I had to, um, it was a little hard for me to figure out because while I am familiar with his work, I am not familiar with him as a person. And so I didn't know if he was Ruslander or Canadier. Because if he's Ruslander, then I have to list all of his accomplishments, his many, many accomplishments. If he's Canadier, then I have to list only a few. And if he's Kleine Gemeinde, then I shouldn't mention any of them at all. <laughs> so I felt a little bit apprehensive. And so I did what any good Mennonite would do. I looked him up on Grandma online and found out that, yes, I'm al allowed to mention some of his accomplishments, um, but if I don't get them all, he's not going to be insulted. <laughs> so, um, David Bergen is the author of, is it now 11 novels with this new one? Yeah. And two collections of so short stories. His work has been nominated um, for a Governor General Literary Award, the Impact Dublin Literary Award, and a Push Card Award. And he, was, he won the Scotiabank Giller Prize for his novel, The Time In Between. And he has also been uh, shortlisted for many, other, many, many other prizes. And so we're here today to introduce his new book, Away From The Dead, which will be released in the fall of 2023. And so I'll just read from the back of the book to uh, introduce it to you. Violence is the domain of both the rich and poor, or so it seems in early 20th century Ukraine during the tumult of the Russian Revolution. As anarchists, Bolsheviks, and the right army all come and go, each claiming freedom and justice, David Bergen embeds his readers into the lives of characters connected through love, family, and loyalty. Len, a bookseller south of Kiev, deserts the army and writes poetry to his love back home. Seblin, an adopted Mennonite Ukrainian stable boy, runs with the anarchists only to discover that love and the planting of crops is preferable to killing. Ina, a beautiful young peasant, tries to stop a Mennonite landowner from stealing her child. In a world of violence, Sablin, Len, and Ina learn to love and hate and love again hoping against all odds that one can turn away from the dead. So I will invite David now to read from his new novel, and then we will have a discussion. I'm going to read from up here. Okay, here. Okay. How's that? Okay, in the back, everybody can hear? Okay. Um, you said everybody should know who David Bergen is. Someone just told me that there's a David Bergen writing letters to the editor in the free press, which are not terribly complimentary to the name David Bergen, <laughs> at least this David Bergen, but I'm not that David Bergen, I am this David Bergen, so I don't write letters to the editor. <laughs> anyway, away from the dead. It is both a, a pleasure well, first I'll say thank you to Aileen and to Ingrid for, for having me here, and it's good to see you all. It's both a pleasure and a fearful thing to be here today. A pleasure to be part of a group that is recognizing the capricious, cap capriciousness and inequality of displacement. And a fearful thing, simply because I am aware of how many historians are in the room. And that basically, yikes, okay? As I note in my acknowledgments, this is a novel all inaccuracies are the authors. I'm going to read a chapter, I read from a chapter five of my novel. Uh, one of my main characters, Julius Lane, a Jewish bookseller who lives both in the colony of Kortitsa and in Ekaterinoslav, where his bookshop is located, has been conscripted at the age of 39 and is, and is headed to the front. He leaves behind Ina Martins, who shares the house with him in Rosenthal. They are not married. They live chastely. 
The chapter is called A Sentimental Journey. And it's just five minutes, so it's not big. <laughs> Lane rode the top of a train to Kyiv with other soldiers, most of them Ukrainian, not one who looked like a soldier or who seemed capable of shooting a gun. He shared an apple with a man older than him who was wearing wooden sandals. A peasant from Guliapol who kept talking about his little girl. She was three and was waiting for him to come home. This man was already planning to desert. Perhaps he might put a bullet in his foot if he could find a pistol. In Kyiv, Lane was billeted with a group of 40 men. They were given uniforms that didn't fit, no boots. This was the Revolutionary Army made up of former whites, new reds, and soon-to-be deserters. The officers, though they followed a new regime, were fighting the same war. Exhaustion reigned. There was some food, which consisted of boiled potatoes and weak tea and old bread. He had heard the night before that drivers were wanted, and the driving lessons were available. It was very easy, very quick to learn, and it was a way to escape the trenches and certain death. He went with Anadi, the apple eater, to find a driving school. Anadi didn't have money and returned to the barracks. Lane used what he had and paid for lessons, which consisted of driving a truck through the streets of Kyiv. Trying to avoid the other drivers who were taking lessons, it was madness. Two hours later, he was given a driver's certificate. He had managed to reach a certain speed to not stall the engine and to avoid pedestrians and carriages and horses and other trucks. He liked the feel of the motor vibrating through the stick shift into his palm. He asked after a possible placement as a driver. He was told to go away. He went back the following morning and demanded a placement as he, sorry. He had traveled the carpet. Oh yeah, he went back the following morning and demanded a placement as a driver again. He was an excellent driver. He had traveled the Carpathians in 1914. He knew mountain roads. He knew the workings of an engine. He knew how to change tires. He was safe. None of this was true. The officer in charge said, go back to your men. He was sent to the front, to Galicia. Dear Ina, the sun is shining. I eat rice kashka. I dig holes. I try to sleep. It is cold. When I do sleep, I dream. I dreamed last night of your knees. He was in a small company of 30 men who were situated at the tail end of a series of trenches. Their trench was in a swamp. Bags of dirt and a bit of sod separated them from the Germans. At night, he could hear the Germans speaking. To stand upright was to invite a bullet in the head, or perhaps a conversation. For this was the situation. There were two mountains. One was called K Koshmashka. The Germans occupied Koshmashka. The Russians, the other mountains, which seemed to have no name. Between them lay the trenches over which planks had been laid. Before the battle, if there was to be a battle, and, none, and no one was certain that a battle would happen, though a battle was certainly imminent, the Germans became very friendly with the Russians. They fraternized. They shook hands, sang songs. They set up a neutral brothel in a village between the lines, and they shared the local women. It was important to get along before killing the other. The Ukrainian company had heard of the brothel, but they were far down the line and had not been invited. And so their bewilderment was heightened, and they said to each other, what is the point of being here if we can't, you know what, before we die? Lane was quite happy not to not have to choose, simply because he didn't know what his choice would be. He wanted to remain loyal to Ina, and yet there was no reason to remain loyal. She was not his wife. They were not lovers. So why such faithfulness? He had no answer. His feet were cold and, cold and wet. He was constantly hungry. He was planning to escape. One day, a commissar arrived, seeing the unkempt group, unkempt group before him and understanding that they were Ukrainians, he began to talk about Ukraine, but the men shut him down. Don't bother us that, with that. We are for the commune. What that meant exactly, Lane wasn't sure. When the commissar spoke, he grinned, which gave him the attitude of not being serious. But perhaps he was serious. He seemed taken aback by the men sitting in the trenches, looking up at him, as if he couldn't make sense of who Lane and his comrades represented, yet wanting to appeal to them in some way, as if to give them good, solid, and friendly words before they charged towards their death. As if to say, let's be friendly. I pity and I love you. Thank you for your sacrifice, your bravery. Have a cigarette. And then he walked off back to his warm hut. 
Lane ached for a hot bath and his books. He dreamed of Ina. If he made it back, he would marry her. He wrote letters. Word had it that the offensive was to start soon. At night, a man cried out, I don't want to die. The Germans must have heard him because now they were laughing. Lane had heard that the Germans were very, very clean. Even in retreat, they swept their trenches. It was like Kortica, where the streets were impeccably clean and the cow shit was cleaned up as soon as it landed, and the houses were freshly painted and the barns were like kitchens. His thinking was going in circles. They went into battle at 4 a.m. the next morning. The news was whispered from above. Their officer made the announcement, and then men, the men began to murmur. Lane had a small knife, no gun. During the first charge, moving across the muddy plain that separated the Russians from the Germans, the soldier in front of Lane made a sound like a laugh, and he, do and he dropped. Lane fell beside him, saw that the soldier had been shot through the mouth. Lane, Lane led, lay there. All around were moans and cries and shouts and swearing. Someone called for his mother. Lane lay still. He believed that if he looked dead, he might be ignored. Or he might be sabred by the Germans, who did not like to take prisoners. He crawled through the mud and dropped into a German trench. It was empty, save for a few bodies. One man was lying on top of another, and they had their arms wrapped around each other as if hugging goodbye. One of his Ukrainian comrades was in the trench, eating something from a small pot. He would eat and then lay the pot on the back of the dead soldier. Are you hungry? The comrade asked. Lane crawled away, following the line of the trench, which was quite clean, with smooth planks for a base and the walls made of wood a safe and warm place. Above was the clickety-clack of the battle. At the far end of the trench, Lane curled up in a ball and began to shake. He heard a low moan that rose in intensity like a cow about to give birth, and he realized it was his own voice. He clamped his mouth with a dirty hand. He may have slept. He may have dreamed. Daylight, a beautiful sun filtered through dirty clouds high above the edges of the trench, a wooden hammer popping against wood. Again and again, voices. A head appeared, peering down into the trench, a German helmet, a blonde mustache, a gun aimed at him. A click, and the blonde man, the blonde German, said, shithead. The German disappeared, reappeared along the barrel of the gun. Lane called out in German that he was German. He had been captured, been forced to fight for the Russians, but he was German. He hadn't killed anyone. The soldier above him smiled, quite a handsome man. He looked 16. The soldier's head disappeared once again and then reappeared, except now he was eating, tearing bread with his teeth from a large loaf. Tell me your story, the soldier said. Lane said that his home was in Baden-Baden. His father and mother owned a sanatorium there, the Villa Frederike. His name was Lehmann Julius. He was a volunteer. The soldier laughed. Your German is northern. You picked the wrong area. Have you ever visited Baden-Baden? He continued to chew. Lane said that his parents were originally from Hamburg. He had never truly acquired the Swabian tongue. You see, that is why you hear the low German in my tones. He quoted some Schiller. The German tilted his head. Are you hungry, he asked. Lane nodded. The soldier made a face of agreement, though he did nothing to feed Lane. He said that his job was to shoot the Russians in the trenches and out in the open, the wounded, the almost dead, those hiding. You are hiding. Lane agreed. He was hiding. The soldier snorted, shook his head. Most of your comrades are dead or on the run. Tell me, what is true? Are you married? Lane said that he was. Your wife's name? Ina Martins. And you have children? A girl, Katka Martins. And where do you live, in truth? Lane said that he lived in a German colony on the Dnieper. Kortica, he said, in Ukraine. Ukraine is beautiful, the soldier said. The grain. Lane agreed. In the distance, there was a shout. The young soldier put his fingers to his lips and shook his head. Don't speak, he whispered. Go back to your wife. And then he aimed his pistol and fired. This time, the gun worked. Thank you. So I think you have them intrigued. <laughs> um, at this conference, uh, as those of you who have been with us throughout the whole session have no, know, we started off with Sarah Claussen talking about her new book, The Russian Daughter. Uh, then we had Sandra Birdsell talking about The Ruslander. And in the case of Sarah, the kernel for her book started from a story told by her mother. 
And in the case of Sandra, it seems like it was the silences in her own family that inspired for her to undertake the telling of the Ruslander. So in your case, you're working within kind of the same time period, give or take. Was there anything within your own family history or family story that helped to uh, at least start you on this path to writing this book? Um, it took, obviously, I'm 66, and this is my 13th book, so it took me a long time to, to, to write the story that I didn't think I would ever write. I, I was aware of, of Sandra's book when it came out, and I only, I confess, I only read it last week. And, and uh, it's, it's wonderful. And, but I think I didn't read it because I was afraid of being influenced in some way in maybe thinking possibly I might write from that place, but not really wanting to. And I, I, I sort of pushed against that whole idea. And then uh, growing up in Neverville, Manitoba, Every October, and, and I see Harold in the back there, he might, he might clarify my story, but uh, uh, Harold Neufeld, uh, who also grew up in Neverville, but every, every October, there was a Sunday night in October when David Dick would get up and he would talk about life in Ukraine. I, was, I, I mean, this started probably when I was about eight years old and, and I, I had the story going up until I was 18 when I left Neverville. And he would talk about um, Machno, and uh, Machno attacking the village, and his family being slaughtered, lined up against the barn and being shot, and uh, how and uh, and what happened then? And, and he would tell the same story every year, every October, and I heard that story, and and um, and being a young boy who was quite fascinated by war, uh, I thought. You know, it was a int very fascinating story, and, uh, and, and I didn't mind hearing it again and again. And David's emotion, Mr. Dick's emotion when he told the story, was, was quite, quite much on point right there. And, of course, he cried every time he told the story. It was very real, and it had happened to him, and, and, and he'd watched it. Um, and then ended up in Niverville. Um, okay, so there's that story. There's my father who came from Ukraine and told many stories about his father, um, being a medic in the White Army, um, and 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 fighting was recruit was recruited to fight with uh, Denikin, and and uh, and so that's that that was part of my my history too. And then and then I started to think about, what well, is should I write this story? Should I mean and and how would I write this story? And then in the end, writing the story, I, I decided to have one of my main characters be a Jewish bookseller. You know, which is uh, is almost evasive, <laughs> and and uh, but I do have some Mennonites, although they are orphans adopted by by a Mennonite estate owner, and so that that's how I came to the story, and and decided, okay, I'm going to have a go at it. Um, I'm I'm going to try to write the story, um, and of course, it it I was, first I was going to write about Machno, because uh, Sean Patterson had just recently published uh, his book uh, Machno and Memory. And which is, is, a, is a, a really a re, retake on who Machno is, and then and then I started to read Machno's memoirs, and I, I, I read about I read Arshinov's book on, on Machno, and uh, of course all of this is mediated, right? I'm, I'm not reading in Russian, I'm not reading in Ukrainian, I'm, I'm and 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 then so I'm reading it mediated, and then I'm mediating it through a novel. So it's doubly, triply mediated in a sense. So you're getting a, a refraction of mirrors going back, so that what is what is actually true. What what and 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 then when I read Machno's memoirs, I was aware that that maybe David Dick had a certain perspective, and he certainly had the experience. But Machno, who was he? So then I researched who he was, and 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 decided in the end not. I had written a whole bunch of the book, um, the ending where Machno's in Paris, and uh, he's walking in, in, the, in the gardens with Ida Mitt, and they're both anarchists. That was tossed out of the book. <laughs> that didn't, I, I, I ended, I ended in, in Ukraine. So that's a long-winded answer. No, we love those types <laughs> of answers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I want to take you back to something that you said, because your evasiveness of the Mennonite aspect of the book was actually 
what I appreciated about the book. Um, you have characters that are on the margin of that society. And I'm just wondering, what does that help us to understand about that time and that period? And not necessarily about Mennonites, but just how does having characters on these this, the outskirts of this society kind of illuminate some new themes for us? I don't, I don't, okay, as a, as a fiction writer, there's never, never the intent that you're going to put a character or a situation into a novel in order to instruct the reader in a certain way. It, 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 you hope that it becomes organic and that you, you're surprised by what the characters do. Um, the fact that I have as a main character Julius Lane, who um, was originally Ju Julius Lehman uh, from, from Odessa, but then was baptized into the, the Orthodox Church to, to, to escape the pale of settlement. Uh, the fact that that is my main character, um, uh, oh, I like, I like Jewish characters. <laughs> so I thought I'd throw in a Jewish character into my novel. But uh, I, the reason that he is there, I mean, he does, you're right, he comes from the outside. He witnesses what happens on, on the colonies. He witnesses what happens on the Martins estate. He's, he's aware, but he's, he's also, um, there's a certain sophistication to him that, that made the novel more interesting to me. Not that Mennonites aren't sophisticated, we, we, <laughs> but, but that, there was something about Julius Lane that I thought, well, there's, there's a guy, and I can also use my love of Russian literature because he's a bookseller. And, and I can throw all, all my, my, you know, uh, my love of that into the novel as well. Yeah, a bit still evasive about these <laughs> Mennonites. <laughs> Did um, I not answer the question? No, 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 you, you answered the question. Um, but uh, I, I do think that you were able to just deal with, uh, maybe even it's a, it's a bit of a protective cover of, so when the community reads the book, it's like, oh, but they're on the margins, so that they, there's not too much interpretation because, as you know, Mennonites love their history and then also love to critique authors of for course. misrepresenting what they feel like is their history. And that leads to sort of my next question is that obviously you, this is not a historical fiction. It's clearly literature. You're, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank, yeah, thank you. I, but, but you do yeah. use history as partially as an inspiration, right? Yeah. Uh, and you mention uh, Peter Dick's diary as, yeah. as, as at least a significant enough source that you would mention it at the end of your book. Yes. So can you maybe discuss that a little bit about how history and literature can actually just intertwine themselves together? Perhaps, perhaps I could read, read my acknowledgments. And it's very brief. And this will give you a sense of how I used... Um, um, Peter J. Dick's book, uh, which I found to be in incredibly okay. So when you're writing, when you're writing something in the past, which is which I've not done a lot of before, um, you can you can read. I read a People's Tragedy by um, uh, Orlando Figes. Yeah, yeah, Orlando Figes, who st who wrote his own reviews on Amazon. <laughs> anyway, he it was it was it was fascinating. Like 900 pages of Russian history during during the Russian Revolution, and and, um, but what did I take from that book and put into this novel? Not very much other than certain facts, but what I took out of Peter J. Dick's memoir and um, Victor Shlovsky's memoir was a lot because they tell you if they have shoelaces or not. They tell you what they're eating for breakfast or if they're not eating. They tell you um, uh, how much money they get it, how much money their partner gets or their spouse gets because they've gone to war. Uh, all the little details that a novice loves are in memoirs, and you, and, and you get the you get the very specific uh, specific details, which I I, I I really loved. So I, I said this: two books were essential to the writing of this novel: A Sentimental Journey, Memoirs, 1917 to 1922 by Viktor Shlovsky, and Troubles and Triumphs, 1914 1922 by Peter J. Dick. The two books exist at the opposite ends of the literary spectrum. Shlovsky was a Russian formalist who published novels, memoir, and literary criticism. Dick was a Mennonite farmer from Latikop Molochna colony, Ukraine, who kept a diary that was subsequently translated and published by his family in Canada. Shlovsky 
is sophisticated. He disguises his art with an effortless detachment. He is humorous, light of touch, and aware of the absurdity of war. Dick's diary is objective and straightforward and not at all self-conscious. His voice is very clear, and he sees the world around him through the objects that are given and taken. He talks a lot about boots and shoes, about food, about the bare necessities of existence. He lists the dead. There is no self-absorption, though he has a dry resignation. And that, that was a, a self-published memoir that was given to me at the, um, at, at the CMU archives by the archivist there, just on chance. Here, try that. And um, led to a lot of rich material. See, history and literature can work together. <laughs> we don't need to always be in conflict with each other. We can take inspiration from each other. And yeah, the, the facts that come through in that book are um, really amazing and do give a sense of everyday life that you just, I mean, you can imagine, but mm -hmm. you, it's nice to have a helping hand from time well, to it time. Is. It is. Um. And so um, in this book, I see, uh, this is my own interpretation, uh, limitations on agency uh, during a period of violence. And you go through some really gut-wrenching scenes and scenarios uh, where the characters are almost resigned to the moving current of their lives, although they try to make these small choices, and these small choices become so important for just holding on to that last bit of humanity. And I guess out of this, I was sort of pondering in my mind whether you see this as a book of mourning or as a book of hope. Hmm. What do you see it as? I'm going to say both. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> a book of mourning or a book of hope? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is. It is because, in the end, uh, there is there is a, a list of the dead, but there it says, it says where they die, and they die in Canada. So they, they did move. There was movement, um, and but there's also mourning that takes place. That 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 characters that I fell in love with die, and, and, um, and, and you see it around you. But it, I mean, it's complete chaos in my reading of it. That, that, and, and it was just army after army going through, past and, and, and returning, and wanting food. And, 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 and uh, Sandra describes that very well in her novel. The, the, the army uh, a squadron settles into a house, and they demand um, soup. They demand clothes. They want the best bedrooms. Um, and so the, the chaos is, is immense. Yeah. Did I answer that? You answered it very nicely, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you don't need my approval. You have a I lot do. of awards, so <laughs> my opinion matters for nothing in this conversation. Not true, not true. <laughs> um, I'm actually wondering, have you ever been to Ukraine? No, and that's, that, that's, that's the interesting part. And usually when I've written a book that's set in Vietnam, Thailand, is, I've been there. And I was going to travel to, Ukra to Ukraine, and... Um, I was going to travel uh, in spring of 2020. <laughs> was 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 trying to make arrangements. I can try to get a translator, and of course, that was that all went away. And uh, I'm sure, I'm sure traveling there would have would have added another um, element to to the book. Now, of course, you're 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 entering a place that is modernized. It's uh, it still it still has some of the aspects of what what. Our, our families left, but um, I suppose you, yeah, I don't know. You've been there. You've done tours. You think it would have benefited? Well, I, well your book is driven by re relationships, and so I don't think you needed the element of either geography or the material culture to mm -hmm. bring to life this story. I think that it is uh, embedded in the relationships that you bring forth to the reader, so right. I think that it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's already published, it has to be okay, but I really do think it's okay. <laughs> it has to be okay. The book is being published. It's a <laughs> the critics can tear me to pieces. That's right. <laughs> we'll leave it to the critics yeah. uh, to figure that one out. Um, so there was a quote in your book, and I believe it was Arena saying it in conversation with Len, and you're going to maybe be elusive about this because I know authors don't like to interpret their own work. They leave it, leave it to the reader and I respect that completely. But I, you know, just 
you don't necessarily have to talk about your own work, but just thinking in general. Uh, so the, in this conversation, she says, that is why we call them stories. They are made up for a greater purpose. And so is there a greater purpose, not maybe to this book, in, but to your own canon of work? Do you feel like there is some sort of driving force that is inspiring this, or is it just in the individual moment something comes to you and you develop it as an author? Oh, I, I love, I mean, I love fiction. I love novels, I love short stories. And I do believe, even as a young boy, I was, I was taken away, even for the sake of entertainment, but, but also for what it evoked um, in the story itself, what it evoked in me. Uh, from, from the actual, what was happening to characters. I, I became the character. So I think for me, and everybody's different, but for me, the fiction moves beyond the facts. And like you said about my characters, it, it, this is, it's more intimate. It's, it's, it's a, a domestic. It's a, it takes us right down to the level where, where most of us live. And, and perhaps we can get at the truth in a different way. Not necessarily the right way, but in a different way than, than through newspaper stories or um, biography. And yeah, so that's, that's um, I'm, 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 I have faith in fiction. <laughs> and it's so intriguing to me that uh, we have a number of sort of um, big authors who are of Mennonite background, maybe don't view themselves as Mennonite authors, but have a Mennonite background that come back to this setting of revolution and chaos and war and destruction and you gave a little highlight of how that played out in Niverville with hearing these stories but can you just elaborate a bit more about like what is the draw and it seems that it, it is a process to tell these stories for you it was a it took you a long time to want to approach it. Uh, we've heard that from other people as well, that this was like something that they didn't actually want to do and want to write, but yet it just remained with them and they had to write it eventually just to get, get rid of it, I guess. Uh, so what do you think it is about this sort of revolutionary Ukraine that is so intriguing for fictional authors? Um, I don't know if I have any correct answer to that. I, I don't, I can only speak for myself. The, I mean, when you hear these stories as, as a young child, as I did, you, you, you accept them at face value. And then as you grow older, like you do with your religion, you start to ask questions and you, you doubt and, and, and you don't necessarily get the answers. And, and then you start to do some research for yourself to figure out, well, is this true? Is it not true? And, and I think, if, there, if there's a hesitation to go there, it has to do with uh, veracity. It has to do with what right do I have to tell that story? Um, well, I could say I have the right to tell the story. I'm not, I'm not stealing the story because my father was born there. Uh, that makes me sort of from there. Um, but I think, I think more than that, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a seeking after, well, what really happened and in, in a novel form, it's a good way to explore it. And that doesn't mean that how we say it happened actually happened that way. Um, I, I can't speak for Sandra, Sarah, Rudy, how they, how they approached their stories. Um, but for me, it was, well, I was also, this is going to sound really crass, I was also entertained by it. And, and there's nothing better about a story than to be entertained, even though it's horrible. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. I mean, it's, it's a period in which so much is taking place, change is constantly happening, and um, there are these decisions being foisted upon people, and it's really a, a, a dehumanizing, humanizing story, and I'm not surprised that authors find that mm -hmm. fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I also uh, appreciate your this hesitancy of, about the emotion, because of course it is an emotional story for those who experienced it and for that trauma that got passed down through the generation and it becomes, you know, almost too hot to touch, mm -hmm. uh, not only for authors of fiction, but also for historians of how do you present this in a way that feels authentic and is, um, understands the pain, but also takes you into in, in new directions uh, of telling that story. So it's... Um, so historians struggle with the same thing. 
<laughs> yes. yes. Yeah, yes. we <laughs> yeah. we do. Yeah. yeah. So maybe at this point, we're going to open it up for some questions. Now, I understand that none of you have read the book, and I know that you all will read the book, but maybe <laughs> you have some more general questions or maybe some specific questions about this novel to ask to David. Ingrid is the first one, but you want to, Ingrid's trying to steal this book from me. All throughout the train ride, she's been trying to <laughs> snag it. My question is, when should you get your pre-published copy, <laughs> Aileen? You may not have it. This is like Harry Potter stuff it's here. An embargo. There's an embargo on it. <laughs> Hi, Diane Dreger. Um, I'm looking forward to your book. I also read Machno and Memory, and it hit me hard. Um, hey, wait a minute, this is not our story. Mm -hmm. These people had a point of view too. Machno was presented as someone who is quite um, important to the people, to poor people, right? So I'm just wondering, you mentioned you didn't end with him, but I'm wondering if you do portray him at all in this book and how you come at that. I do uh, briefly. Uh, one of my characters <clears throat> is forced to join the the anarchists as they run and, and rampage, and um, the leader of that is Marussia, and she was a she was a partner of uh, Machno, and so she around the, the fires and stuff tells the Sabline, who's the character of my my character, tells Sabline about uh, Machno, and he's not an anti-Semite. He's fighting for the peasants. Uh, don't believe every story you, you hear. And then she proceeds to tell different stories from another perspective. So he doesn't make a, a, a direct appearance, but only through Marisha's stories. So yes, he does appear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, uh, Vic Reimer uh, from Fergus, Ontario, uh, via Saskatoon, I suppose. <laughs> anyway. Um, Barry and I have read your books, most of them, and we really have enjoyed them, so thank you for your thank you. creativity. The um, craziness here that is um, your book, your new book, suggests a book that both of us have read fairly recently uh, called um, The Winter Soldier. I think that's the full title. And it's similar in concept. It's written by uh, a physician in California, but it's First World War, the uh, dynamics of the uh, Hungary, Austro-Hungarian Empire at war against, uh, you know, Russia. And here's a medical doctor, not yet trained, but he's at the front lines. And then there's the, uh, the issues of falling in love, and uh, there's no resolution of that, really. And so, anyway, if you haven't read it, I would suggest that you do. You might Thank have you. another book. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Oh. Okay. Could you describe the cover of the book? Yes. Yeah. Would you describe the the image. Can I describe the cover of the book. Well, it went through um, various iterations. Uh, at first, it was in, in it was complete, it had no image on the front, and it had block letters in the in the sort of formalist uh, Russian 1920s look. Um, then we were told by a major bookstore in Canada that that was would not sell, so we moved away from that. You can tell what kind of clout they have, um, and then uh, it. And then this was offered, and it, it, it actually almost, it almost has a, uh, a Jewish prayer shawl feel to it. I, I, I get this sense, that, at least that's what someone said. But it's a, it's a, it's a rag hanging from, from the top and, and descending, and it's torn. And then, of course, there's the, the text at the bottom. Um, one can make of it what they want. And it's basically covers. I mean, yeah, so that's, that's it. 
This question is not for Aileen, but for David. Uh, David, I was wondering about your title, because that's the only thing Aileen let me read. And, um, <laughs> and we were surmising that perhaps you wanted to get away from all these tales of the dead that we had when we were young people. We had other thoughts. Uh, why the title? Um, it was the last, it's the last line in the book. And um, it uh, is originally, for my working title, title, I had it as The Dead. And of course, James Joyce has a short story called The Dead. And um, there are a lot of zombie books called The Dead. <laughs> and, and either I'm going to be compared to James Joyce or to some zombie writer. So um, it was my friend Larry who, who read the novel one of my first readers, and, and he, he uh, after he finished the book, he says, there's your title at the end, Away from the Dead. And it has, I think it, uh, it has, has that combination that Eileen was talking about, Eileen was talking about the, the mourning and the hope. So that's, that's where it came from. Titles are hard. I, I find them very, very difficult. And, uh, and then when an editor doesn't like a title that you love, then it becomes even more, more difficult. Yeah. Then it becomes a battle. Yeah. <laughs> So it was a perfect title, and I didn't bring it up, Ingrid, because it's just a lovely thing when you get to it at the end of the book. So yeah, it's sort of, sort of it, everybody knows the ending now. Yeah, it, it's very. <laughs> it, it was like a, 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 an astonishing moment for me when I got there, and so yes, it, mm, but good. people not watching this on Zoom will be able to experience yeah. in, in full. Any other questions for David? You can have another one, Ingrid. You've organized a whole tour across Canada, so you get whatever you want. Um, have you read um, Sarah's book and I haven't Sandra's yet. book? I read Sandra's. And Al Reimer's book, My Harp is yes, Turned yes. to Morning. Yes, I, I remember read that reading one. that when I was very young. And Rudy yeah. Weeb, etc. Yeah. Do you see any kind of commonality between um, these authors and this tale? Uh, are there common features that have drawn authors to this tale, as far as you know? There's a there's a there's a commonality in in obviously in in theme, in in the story, in the history. Um, I think we're all very different writers, and and we have different voices and different styles that we bring to a, to a story, and uh, so that and that would be up to the reader to decide. Oh, this this is how this story is told, etc. And so, but my my take is that. Um, um, I've always, I've, I've, I admire all of them, but I think we approach a story differently in, in, in voice and story. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, Andrew Unger. Uh, you mentioned um, the, uh, in your introduction uh, about inaccuracies, and then you talked about being sort of nervous talking to uh, a group of historians. But probably most of your readers reading the book are not historians, so I'm just wondering how much do potential inaccuracies actually matter to you, and is there a difference between um, inaccuracies that just may come about by accident and then deliberate choices you're making as a fiction author? Yeah, good, good question, Andrew. I, I think there, there will definitely be inaccuracies in my geography and sometimes in, in places that, that are, are, are wrong and even where, where an estate is in relation to, to the river, on which side of the river it's on, that sort of thing. Um, where, where, I where I felt I had to be accurate, and, and this, is, this was important to me, is that if I'm going to throw an historical character into the novel, like Viktor Shlovsky, um, it has to make sense to the story. I can't just throw them in because I want them in there. So I was reading Viktor Shlovsky's uh, memoirs, and he talks about getting injured during the war, and he's going by train up to St. Pete's. He calls it St. Petersburg. And, and he uh, has an attendant with him. He does not name the attendant. And I'm, I'm reading this, and I thought, oh, that's a godsend. My character is his attendant. <laughs> and so I, I, threw, I threw Lane into the novel as Shlovsky's attendant. So Shlovsky makes an appearance in the novel, and Lane is his, his sort of nurse attendant. And then I get Shlovsky to be able to talk, and I can use Shlovsky's book. And, and, and so it was like, uh, it's one of those sort of like 
moments of, wow, that's wonderful. Shlovsky's there and Lane, Lane is the attendant and, and nobody, can, nobody can contest this, of course, right? Because nobody knows who that attendant was. Yeah, so things like that are important to me, that, that the details are right. Uh, but the smaller things, well, I'm sure people will find lots, lots to say that are wrong. Yeah. Jerry. Hi, Joan Garbett. I'm from Brandon University, and I'm, a, I'm not Mennonite. I'm an interloper here, so <laughs> please be kind. Um, I'm just, you're the most famous person I've had the chance to ask this question to, but I'm, so I'm going to put it out there. Uh, how scared are you of chat GPT and AI? <laughs> I, I say good luck to chat reading Viktor Shlovsky. <laughs> If he wants, if, if, if they can, if ChatGPT can figure out how to put Victor Shlovsky and my character Lean into the same novel and make it work, good luck. Good luck. I'm not that scared of it. No. And if, if, if you want ChatGPT to write, if you want to read shitty books, read ChatGPT books. <laughs> also bad history. If you want bad, bad, history, bad history, you can use yeah. ChatGPT. Jerry. Uh, Jerry Friesen, uh, uh, David and I have a backyard conversation running back years, and what strikes me is, first of all, you're always on the lookout for a story. It, story is everything for you. Um, but you've picked boundaries for this book that were very clear in your head, even before you started looking for a story, it seems to me, uh, why did you pick that place and time? Did I tell you in one of our backyard chats what those boundaries were? <laughs> <laughs> well, I see them as being 1910 to 25, mm -hmm and Ukraine. Yes, I, actually it starts 1900 when the first, the first chapter is called La The Lady with the Dog, which of course is Chekhov's um, short story, that one of his most famous short stories that he published. And Lane finds the story and reads it to his potential lover. And, and so it starts in 1900 and goes to 1919. So th you mean a, 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 a geograph or a, a, a timeline boundary? Is that what you mean? I'm not, I'm not going to Canada. I'm saying you're, you're looking for a story and you started out looking for a story in that time and in that place. Yeah. And that both are boundaries that you started out with and you were looking for a story within those boundaries. Yes, I was. And I wasn't sure if I could find it. Why did I look for stories in those boundaries? I think Aileen, you sort of asked me this question, and I didn't have a good answer. I was evasive. Um, I, like I said, I, I, I'd heard the stories as a young boy. I wasn't sure if the stories were true, and I wasn't sure if it mattered if they were true. They were just good stories. Um, and I wanted to have a go at my own story around that, uh, around that time. My, my father told many stories, and my father brings to his life and to his family and to his children the, the piety that, that um, a lot of people brought out of that place. And, um, and that piety scares me. Um, I don't like it. <laughs> and uh, perhaps I also wanted to push at that piety. And, and so that was one of the boundaries that I was probably look, pushing against and, and interested in. <laughs> if I can follow up on that, yeah, so there really isn't a lot of religion no. in, in the book. There isn't a lot, I mean, there is some church mentioned, but mm. that isn't a setting that you dwell upon no. at all. And so you're telling us that that was a, a a choice that was made it was on purpose. it it didn't it didn't there 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 are there are moments there, there uh, Sabine uh, there are people who who stand up at an evangelistic service and become Christian um, uh, 
so they're, they're, that it's on the periphery. It's always there. Uh, people's gossip, people's behavior. That it's always it's always talked about. But no, I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm I didn't. I didn't think it was necessary for the for this novel, especially with a Jewish bookseller. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. I just uh, put together a photo exhibit that is uh, faith loss renewal, the Ruslander Mennonites, and so. Oh. Um, it, 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 this is also part of what I appreciated of your novel is it starts to make us think outside of those very specific boxes that have been created around the Ruslander story that um, we reproduce in part because they are meaningful and they also describe the people who experienced that particular moment in history, but being able to go beyond that is now, you know, 100 years later, maybe it's time yeah. right, to move on a little bit. And to go to those margin places and see what we can learn, learn and discover there. Yeah, definitely. Just out of curiosity, how long did it take you to write the book? Where's the question? Oh, there. Hi. Um, uh, well, I started it when I was eight years old. <laughs> and listening to David Dick tell his story about Machno in uh, Niverville. The actual writing three, three and a half, four years. And it's such a small book. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, about that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, I'm Alton Ostai. I'm an historian. Um, I've also been investigating uh, Magno for uh, my thesis. And for me, it was very complex because I knew him from an anarchist tradition and why he was a kind of anarchist saint. Then I uh, researched Mennonite experience and then it was completely the opposite. Uh, so for me, the question is, you, or you said your question was to find out who Magno was. Who was Magno for you? Now you've written the novel. Well, like I said, it, it, the novel is not about Machno, though I read his memoirs and I read Arshanao's book on Machno, uh, Machno, I'm sure you've read that. And, and um, who is Machno for me? He's not, he's not the man that I thought he was when I, when I was eight years old. Um, he's not the man I thought he was when I was 18 uh, or even 26. He, he is a, a, a very complicated man who, who, who really believed in Ukraine. And he believed in in the peasants, and he believed in in um, um, anarchy. And, and he believed. Now, the, the problem with that is, is that uh, today's today's hero, today's anarchist, anarchist is the, is next year's uh, despot, and, and we can see that all the time. That that power corrupts the person who. Who, who takes over? He never had that opportunity to take over because he was he was on the run, and ended up in Paris. Um, did he do terrible things? I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. I, I'm sure. Did he have control over his men all the time? No, he didn't. And they did terrible things. He he ended up um, taking care of people who who um, killed the Jews. He 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 was against that. So um, he was complicated. Uh, I don't. I don't know if I would want to eat supper with him. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'd want to go camping with him. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. Did you read the memoirs by Gerhard Schroeder? Because he actually ate with him. And did he? No, I he did. And this is. Uh, this was one for me. That was one uh, one of the most complicated stories for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, uh, he had uh, he had contacts with Magno. He ate with him, and yeah. then after uh, the typhus epidemic, uh, Mennonites had taken care of Magnus. I did. I did and, read that. And then that. later, yeah. even Magnus uh, were taken care of uh, by Mennonites after yes. 1922. Yes. So this is for me makes. A, a story even more complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it does. I, I, I do recall. There's so many things I don't remember reading, but uh, but yeah, that. Uh, so maybe I would eat with him. <laughs> yeah, but but it, very complicated. Yeah. Is there one last question? Because we can't end on eating with Machnol. I, <laughs> I refuse to end the conference with that. Hi. Um, it's making all this talk about Machno is making me think 
as my grandmother told me, and she's now deceased, she lived through the revolution, Maria Buhler, she said, we had too much. She understood why people were taking away their things and why they were angry. Um, I'm wondering what your novel says about that. Um, it doesn't, it, it says a lot about it, but not directly. Um, again, it's not didactic. Uh, it's implied. There are, there's an estate owner, Heinrich Martins. Um, um, he thinks he's a good man. Sometimes he's not. And I do believe that comes through. Um, too much? That's always the question. Did, they, did the Mennonites there have too much? And Machno, to go back to him, we, uh, he, he did work for a Mennonite estate owner when he was 14 uh, and uh, was not treated well and despised the, the, the young dandy Mennonite boys who looked down at him. And uh, I don't think he lasted there very long. Then he went to prison and learnt his anarchy in prison. This is the great educator, of course, prison. And, uh, um, but as far as the Mennonites go and, and their wealth, a lot, a lot, my father wasn't wealthy. He came out of, out of Ukraine. Um, but a lot of people were, and some of them made it and some of them didn't. A lot of them made it to Niverville. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jerry has one more question. Just, there's a quote from Omar el Akkad on the, uh, on the cover. Yes, Omar el Akkad, yes. I can't read it. Oh, he... he what did, and why did, why Omar? Why Omar? Because I know Omar, and I like Omar, and Omar has some clout. <laughs> and, you, and when you get a blurb, you want someone with, with some clout or that you might recognize. Oh, you can't read it? Oh, gosh, do I have to read that? Okay. No, well. You read it. I'll read it. <laughs> Look at the awkward situation you created there, Jerry. Um, behind the immense restraint of Bergen's beautifully crafted sentences, there is an overflow of life, a cast of characters so deeply human in their desires and failings. Away from the Dead is a deceptively stunning novel, a testament to the resurrection power, resurrective power of love against what history might otherwise obliterate. obliterate written by one of Canada's best. And on the front it says, a testament to the resurrection power of love. Thank you. So on that note, we will conclude our talk. Thank you, everyone. Let's thank David. And just a couple of announcements as we end our conference. So um, first of all, I'd like to thank all the volunteers. I'd like to thank Ben knobs Jeremy Weeb for helping organize this conference, and the University of Winnipeg, and all, everyone who financially supported this endeavor. Uh, it, with great gratitude, I think we have had a successful commemoration of the 1920s Ruslander migration. And, and uh, we will have an, a reception right now to sort of celebrate David's novel that I'm sure many of you will pick up in the fall. And finally, don't forget about the Zanger Fest tonight. And there is really a wonderful exhibit at the Zanger Fest by Stephanie uh, Stoby. Uh, and it's an award-winning exhibit that's traveling across Canada. And you might want to get there a little bit early for those of you who have Zanger Fest tickets just to take in this exhibit. So thank you to everyone here and on Zoom who have participated in this conference. And we look forward to welcoming you again at the University of Winnipeg in the fall of 2024. So thank you. <laughs>